Okay. That's that hasn't happened in a very long time. But it's 2020. Everything happens. <laughs> That's true. Come on. Right. We are we are back live on YouTube. Uh, I'm gonna delete the old video since um, there was no there was never the meeting was never started officially on that. Thank you, John. Alrighty, um, I believe uh, Bell, am I correct? We are, we yes. have quorum? We have quorum, we're good. Very good. Well, good morning everybody and uh, thanks for your patience with the technical stuff. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, Commission, City of San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture to order. Um, and um, I would uh, like to have, um, I would like to read the statement of purpose and vision this time. I haven't done this in a while. And uh, so I'm gonna find, oh gosh, I can find a piece of paper. Here it is. Gosh, I'm sorry. Jason, can you do it for me, please? I thought I had it at the bottom of this page. You're muted, Jason. I get to do it twice. Okay. Thank so you. purpose, the city of San Diego commission for arts and culture serves in an advisory capacity to the mayor and city council on promoting, encouraging, and increasing support for the region's artistic and cultural assets, integrating arts and culture into community life and showcasing San Diego as an international tourist destination. Our vision, expanding our world by celebrating creativity in San Diego. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Alrighty, um, I would like to ask my colleagues on the commission uh, to keep your video on throughout the meeting to remain as accessible as possible to our audience. Um, and as you know, this is a public meeting, so um, people are uh, watching and will be watching on YouTube. Um, I am gonna do a quick roll call uh, to confirm your attendance. So when I call your name, please unmute yourself and say present. Commissioner Frank? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Blevins? Commissioner Bossler? Present. Thank you. Commissioner DeCenzo? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Hughes? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson? Commissioner Meza? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Opsid? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Schoenbrunn? Commissioner Whooper? Present. Thank you. Your attendance has been noted. Also joining us today is arts and culture staff, including executive director, Jonathan Gluss, Chief of Civic Arts Strategies, Christine Jones, Senior Arts and Culture Funding Manager, Leticia Gomez Franco, Senior Public Art Manager, Chuck Miller, Project Manager, Bel Reza, Arts and Culture Project Manager, Carla Centeno Aguirre, and Civic Art Project Manager, Dr. Laura Bullock, as well as representative from the Office of Boards and Commission um, and the City Attorney's Office and the City IT Department. Um, before we get into the agenda, I'm going to call on Leticia to uh, just give us a rundown on the guidelines for the meeting, the technical side of things, please. Yes, good morning, commissioners, and welcome to our first commission meeting on Zoom. Uh, we've transferred over from Teams, but you will find that the platform works pretty much the same. Uh, to mute and unmute yourself, you're going to want to click on the little microphone button. We do ask that uh, everyone please remain muted until um, you would like to speak, and do please remember to unmute yourself when you want to speak. Um, the camera button will turn your camera on and off. Uh, we do ask uh, that commissioners and staff please leave their cameras on for the duration of the meeting. 
We will continue using the chat box um, to signify when you would like to speak. So if you would like to make a motion, second a motion, or participate in a discussion, uh, please open up your chat box and type speak on there. And Chair Putre will call on you in the order that it comes in. That's it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, do we have some non-agenda public comment today? Uh, okay. We we do have some. Um... Sorry about that. Um, yes. Good morning, commissioners. We do have a number of non-agenda public comments, which I'll read through right now. Thank so you. Our first non-agenda public comment comes from Peter Kalivas from the PGK Dance Project. For the last 18 years in San Diego, PGK Dance has been about challenging where dance happens and how it is presented, accessed, and enjoyed by passing theater spaces in exchange for more familiar public spaces and using creative placemaking strategies to ensure diverse professional contemporary dance is affordable and more easily accessed by the public. Pivoting to the virtual space is just one more iteration of that. Our new PGK dance film perspectives can be seen throughout October at these festivals. October 23rd in Palm Springs International Dance Festival, October 23rd through 25th at the Los Angeles Dance Festival, October 30th and 31st at the City Contemporary Dance Festival in Hong Kong, China. Our newest 30 minute long interactive show, Inside Out, featuring an additional works in collaboration with phenomenal local cinematographers, Ryan Kuratomi and Max Kukos, remains available for $5 on demand via our website provided below. Since Inside Out premiered six days ago, 300 people have enjoyed it and danced with us in seven states and three countries from the comfort and safety of their homes. Photo of our ad from the SD Reader attached. Thanks to the Commission for Arts and Culture who has supported us since 2007, we are able to survive and thrive. www.pgkdanceproject.org. The second public comment comes from Peter Kamiski. Good morning, Chair Putre and members of the Commission. My thanks to members of the Arts and Culture San Diego, a coalition of over 100 arts and culture organizations in San Diego, who engaged all 10 candidates for the five available council district. Uh, council district seats in recorded public forums. Please visit artsandculturesd.org slash 2020 to review the candidates' answers and watch their comments. Vote for Arts and Culture San Diego. And the final non-agenda public comment comes from Teresa Cozen. Good morning, commissioners. My comments are on behalf of Arts and Culture San Diego. I'd like to share a glimmer of hope for the return of in-person events. Last week, I attended a paint and wine evening at the New Children's Museum. It was their first event in seven months of closure and gave their staff an opportunity to share the museum again and have an artist lead us through a painting lesson to create our own masterpiece based on the museum's Wobble Land art installation. Online content continues to feature unique collaborations between small and large arts and cultural organizations. Since Halloween parties are frowned upon, you can join San Diego Shakespeare Society actors on October 31st as they share a Halloween inspired virtual SDMA plus performance combining art from the museum's collection and spooky selections from William Shakespeare's Macbeth, Othello and the Temp Tempest. This is our cultural ecosystem in action, organizations of various sizes and budgets supporting each other sharing resources and nurturing talented artists and rebuilding San Diego. That concludes public comment for non-agenda. Thanks, Christine. <clears throat> and thank you everybody who submitted comments. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to the chair's reports. Um, the big thing uh, for me anyway right now is trying to figure out how we can uh, best organize all of us into committees to get the work done. And we are already doing a lot of things in various committees. There's a lot of, um, a, a lot happening in policy and funding. Uh, public art has been working on projects there and um, UDOCA and the um, ad hoc committee have work to do with the DEI project that is moving forward, <clears throat> pardon me. So I'm inclined um, since it, after the first of the year, there'll be a new chair at some point um, appointed by a new mayor. Um, I'm inclined to let everything stay the way it is, keep working on what we're working on, keep moving forward with good progress on especially the DEI work 
and whatever we can do to help our community of artists. We'll be talking about that later in the public art uh, committee. Um, and so that's what I'm inclined to do is to let the next person um, have the vision of how these committees should work and make those choices instead. Um, the problem is that we um, all have been on all the committees uh, and long enough that um, it's almost impossible to put anybody anywhere because of these term restrictions. So in order to even stand pat, we would have to, um, in I'm November, sorry. we would have- I'm interrupting, this is John Dwyer from Hi, John. Deputy City Attorney. Um, I don't see this on the agenda. I didn't see an item where we were discussing appointments to committees or anything with regard to positions on the commission. I just right. see an, what I, an item for commission meeting minutes. Okay, so what I was going to say is we'll be put, talking about that in November was the point of bringing it up. Is that okay? John? Yes, that's okay. Okay, great. So anyway, in November, we'll have an action item uh, to formalize all of that. Um, I mentioned that because we did say, I did say last time we would talk about it. Okay, next up is the pardon me, the commission meeting minutes from last month. Um, and um, if you would like to make a motion uh, about the minutes, please open your chat box and say type speak. Somebody like to make a motion to accept the minutes from last month, Tyler? Motion with great thanks to the staff for preparing them. Thank you very much. Ann? Second. Great. Uh, does anybody have any, um, any changes to make or any comments to make uh, regarding the minutes? All righty. Um, then we will go ahead and uh, vote on that. And I'll call your name and you will unmute yourself and respond yay or nay or abstain. And do remember, you don't have to have been at the meeting in order to vote on this. So, uh, Commissioner Frank? Yay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bossler? Yay. Commissioner Blevins? Uh, Commissioner DeCenzo? Yay. Commissioner Hughes? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Meza? Yay. <clears throat> Commissioner Obsted? Abstain. And Commissioner Whooper. <clears throat> yay. And my vote is a yay. Thank you. All righty. Um, let's move on to committee reports, uh, policy and funding. Is there any public comment to be read regarding this item? No, there's no public comment for this item. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bossler, would you like to share your committee report? Okay, yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Bostler. I'm the chair of the Policy and Funding Committee. Um, to give you a brief update on what we've been doing, uh, we held our monthly meeting on October 9th, uh, where we heard from staff regarding both fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22. Leticia Gomez Franco will report later in this meeting um, about our expanded outreach efforts this year and for the fiscal 22 application period. We also had two additional reports. The first uh, was from Laura Dietrich from USD's Nonprofit Institute. Laura presented initial findings from the confidential COVID-19 financial impact survey that fiscal year 20 contractors completed as part of their fiscal year 20 final report requirements. There was quite a lot of information shared and we will be unpacking that over the next few months and how the findings impact the field in the short term and beyond. Um, what I'd like to leave you with is that um, we heard that 97 million in lost revenue in four and four and 10 workers at our contractor institutions were either furloughed or laid off. And we're anticipating this only to continue to get worse. Just think about this, 40% unemployment. We'll be picking the study up again in early November and at our next policy and funding committee meeting. 
The second report was presented by Pat Libby, and this was a study on the theater sector. The report offers an alternative organizational model or several models for greater sustainability on the theater sector now and into the future. This was a first glimpse into the report and we anticipate hearing again from Pat in the coming months as the research continues. Next month, we will continue with the information, um, heavy meetings with a report from RISE Research and Evaluation on their DEI analysis of our work and potentially a deeper dive into the creative economy study uh, that we're gonna hear a bit about this morning. These past few months have been transformative and we are eager for a deeper look into the analysis coming from all of these studies and dialogue with the community about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Um, and, and thank you uh, for the uh, extra meetings this month. Very informative. Alrighty, uh, let's see. Uh, next up is public art. Do we have any, um, uh, let's see, public comment? Yes, we do have one public comment on this item, which I'll read. So the comment comes from Patrick Stillman. Full disclosure, I submitted art that was not accepted. As an art gallery owner, professional arts mentor, I applaud the efforts behind SC practice. It's a rare opportunity to purchase a half a million dollars of art from local artists, bravo. Before you, before you is a fine collection of art that mainly adheres to the academic viewpoint of the, defi of the defining modern art. This is naturally in alignment with the similar scholarly backgrounds of the jurors. That said, I believe that the city missed an opportunity by not diversifying its jurors. The inclusion of arts leaders from visual arts organizations, art galleries, and esteemed local artists would have created a very different collection. The struggle between academic pursuits and technical excellence is centuries old. San Diego has its own division that this collection reinforces by highlighting pandanic works over traditional artistic practice. As a civic art collection, I would expect more inclusivity of the experiences of, of citizenship, democracy, and identity that make up a majority of the works being done by San Diego's professional artists. This is a rare opportunity for the city and its artists and which could have been better represented in, in the arts community. Thank you for your time. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Ben, would you like to go ahead and um, give us a committee report and introduce your action item, please? Yes, uh, so we do have an action item uh, regarding the acquisition of artworks for the Civic Art Collection through SE Practice. Um, we recommend to the city of San Diego the purchase of 105 artworks through SD Practice for inclusion in the Civic Art Collection as submitted by SD Practice Artwork Selection Panel. At, at this time, I'd like to call on Christine to give us an overview of the initiative and recommendation. Christine? Thank you, Commissioner Mesa. So um, we have a presentation. So um, let's see if we can get that up on the screen for you. Um, so while that's coming up on the screen, I just um, want to, um, as has been indicated, or Commissioner Mesa indicated, I'll be presenting the Public Art Committee's recommendation. Um, and this is for the first iteration of the city's SD Practice Contemporary Art Initiative. So before I do that, I wanna give you a little bit more background on the Civic Art Collection, as well as the initiative itself. So next slide. So as many of you know, the Civic Art Collection contains art assets um, owned by the city for public benefit. Uh, commission staff is charged with managing this collection and stewarding the collection for the city. And this includes acquiring artworks as well as the conservation and maintenance of those works. Uh, the collection began back in 1909. Some of you might know it began unofficially with the city ex acceptance of a donation of the Horton Plaza Fountain, which is um, in Horton Plaza Park. So that was donated by a local businessman at the time who later became mayor of San Diego. And there's a bronze plaque um, on that work called Broadway Fountain for the People. So since that time, the city's acquired artworks of historical importance, artistic significance, the co current collection uh, is obviously exhibited in public spaces, public buildings, municipal spaces. It's distinguished further by commissioned works, which has been the primarily focus of, of the public art program over the last 
um, maybe 20 years. And these works are integrated into libraries, facilities, fire stations, public spaces, parks throughout the city. So next slide. So the collection itself, um, there is a mission for the City Civic Art Collection, and it, that's really focused on demonstrating creativity, innovation, and art practices. It, the works are encouraged to stimulate discussion, exchange of ideas, and balance humanization uh, with urbanization with humanizing elements, and really honor the history and heritage of San Diego, while also reflecting the diversity and character of the city and incorporating a global perspective. The scope of the collection really is focused primarily on works uh, from the period of 1900 to, to present and includes a range of works primarily by American artists with a focus on the San Diego region. Next slide. So we've been working um, within our collection management um, system. We've been doing a brief snapshot analysis to try to start contextualizing the collection. And some really interesting things are starting to emerge um, in this data analysis of the collection itself. So it's important for us to start understanding context of the institutional um, and art history of the collection. And this will really allow us to better understand the current scope of the collection in more detail, take stock of its history, how things were acquired, and really help us to chart a path forward for future yeah. acquisitions. So this slide, um, as you can see, shows that there's, well, there's over 800 artworks in the collection. And um, as I mentioned, um, the very first donation to the city was back in 1909. The works in the collection, you'll see that there's an overwhelming amount of works that have been donated um, since the initial um, initiation of the collection. So there's a large volume of donations, um, which obviously also considers things like politics, donate donors taste, collecting habits of donors. So an overwhelming 75% of the collection is donations. Um, so it, for example, in the 1970s, nine, 99 Hogarth prints were donated to the city. In the 90s, uh, the Aztec Brewery collection, which is comprised of over 70 elements, furniture to architectural elements to murals was donated to the city. In the 2000s, there were um, two collections of mid-century works donated to the city as well as 27 realist paintings. So um, what's interesting is that when it comes to actually purchase, there have been very little purchases for the collection itself over the, the life of the collection. So there's only been about 21 artworks that have actually been intentionally purchased. So in the in 1930s, 40s, there was two works purchased. And back in the 1990s, there were 16 works purchased for the collection. In the last 20 years, there have only been three artworks that have been purchased for the collection by the city, um, all purchased by of, of works by local artists. Let's go to the next slide. One of the other things that we're, um, we, when, when we organize information in the collection management system and organize the collection, we often collect, organize by collection type. So we've kind of categorized these internally as heritage, contemporary, and public art. Um, the majority of pieces in the collection, as you can see, over 45% uh, of the collection falls into what we call heritage. So this collection really is a repository for early California art. So there's a number of early California paintings in the collection, as well as works that were commissioned during the Works Progress Administration. Notable works um, in the collection are by artists such as Alfred Mitchell, Maurice Braun, Charles Fries, Bill Barishano. And you'll also see in the collection, um, this collection also includes a lot of work from the 1950s and 60s. We've had a number of donations, as I mentioned, of mid-century works. So the collection is, uh, also includes works by Jackson Ellen Marie Woolley, Russell Baldwin, and Richard Allen Morris. Uh, contemporary holdings for the collection um, are much more eclectic, um, in large part due to a number of donations um, and by a few donors. Um, during that period. And there's works from everything from a very small work by Kiki Smith to mixed media photos by Ben Dawn. Uh, gaps that we're starting to see in the collection in terms of San Diego art history and contemporary art practices uh, include conceptual artwork after 1970s, Chicano art, new media work, light and space works. And this is only to name a few. Next slide. 
So when you start breaking it down by object type, and when I say object type, I'm, I'm talking about like drawings or installations or photographs, we start to see some of the areas where the, the holdings are stronger and some of the areas um, where they're not as strong. So for example, there's not that many photographs currently in the collection, contemporary photographs or photographs in general, whereas um, there's quite a few installations um, and paintings, which, which makes sense given the heritage collection and the, the early California paintings. Next slide. So artworks, um, as you can imagine, are acquired by the collection in, in a number of ways. As I mentioned, donations have been predominant. Um, and there, we also can acquire through purchase, bequest, transfer, exchange. And what you are most commonly um, participate in is the commissioning, uh, where we commission an artist to create artworks. Next slide. So just quickly going through these slides, um, again, donations have been the strong suit of how the city has acquired things over the last, um, I don't know, over 100 years. Next slide. Works such, again, like this um, arrangement, which are works that were all donated primarily by local um, collector Walter Pomeroy, specifically to be exhibited in libraries. Next slide. There, like this, there was an early California painting such as this that had been acquired through the years. Next slide. This is another donation. This is a work that was donated when the Central Library opened its doors. Next slide. And um, sometimes transfers happen. So sometimes when uh, an, uh, an agency, such as when Center City Development Corporation um, transferred artworks to the city, such as the Quincy Troop work you see here. So this is a work um, in the collection. Next slide. And this is the other part of that work. This is in, in a park across the street from the New Children's Museum downtown. And next slide. And again, what you're most probably aware of and what we do is, is commissioning artists and creating artworks that way. So next slide. And we've obviously commissioned a number of works. Again, this is some pieces from the Central Library when that was open. So next slide. And this work as well. These are both in the Central Library. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned, um, it's been much more uncommon for uh, the city to acquire artworks through direct purchase. So next slide. As I mentioned, there's only been a handful of works um, that have been purchased by the city. This is one of those works that was purchased specifically for the Central Library Gallery because um, Sculpture Courtyard, it, it fit so amazingly that it was purchased um, back and there, uh, when the library opened. So next slide. So I wanted to give you a little bit of context with regards to the collection. Um, so, and then I just wanna move in a little bit into SD practice itself. So as you all know, um, SD practice was initiated as part of the mayor's stimulus. Um, and really this was focused on acquiring artwork by contemporary artists in San Diego County based artists specifically. And it was designed to also uh, focus on diversifying and starting to strengthen the holdings in the city's collection. So as you might remember, the acquisitions for the collection um, is made possible by a monetary gift from the late Thomas O. Rasmussen, who was an avid contemporary art collector. So we really appreciate that generous donation that he was able to provide the city. So next slide. So just to remind you some of the goals that we had identified for this initiative, which again was really to support creative practice here in San Diego, diversify the holdings of the collection, advance the mission of the collection, and, and identify artworks and place artworks in public settings that um, can respond to and interact with um, the, the kind of spaces um, in the local context. So next slide. So as you might recall, we issued an RFP. Again, it was open to San Diego County artists back in May. So artists apply by submitting um, qualifications as well as documentation about artworks that were available for purchase. 
Um, back in September, the city convened an artwork selection panel that reviewed and evaluated the applications. Um, we did receive 552 artists um, responded to the call just to understand the, the, the number of artists in San Diego that were interested in this initiative. So again, in September, the artwork selection panel met. They were able to, based on using the criteria, they shortlisted to 101 applications that were shortlisted for further review. Based on their evaluations, the panel is recommending these 105 artworks for direct purchase by the city. So let's go to the next slide. So um, the, I would just say, add that the artwork selection panel is comprised of commissions, public art committee and visual art professionals. Um, I wanna acknowledge and thank them for the record. They, um, as you can imagine with 552 artists responding to the call, there was quite a volume of information and materials to review. So this um, selection panel uh, that included public art committee member, Anthony Graham, Ung Young Park, Alessandra Montezuma, who is a, a local artist and gallery director at San Diego Mesa College, Derek Cartwright, uh, who's a director of university galleries at um, USD, as well as Gaidi Finney, who's executive director of the San Diego African American uh, Museum of Fine Art. Um, these panelists brought a wealth of experience in collection stewardship, acquisition, art history, art practice, and curation. They have brought a diversity of perspectives and views from local knowledge of, of, of artists here in San Diego to expertise in international contemporary art. So I want to just thank them for their service. Um, this was a, a, a unprecedented in, in terms of a panel review for um, our office. And I also want to acknowledge public art team, Chuck and Laura, for all of their hard work on, on getting us to this point with the initiative. So as for the artworks themselves, um, so the 105 artworks proposed by the panel include a diverse range of object types, um, everything from paintings and sculptures to works on paper, to photographs, to prints, to fiber art, new media art and installation work. So what I wanna do now is just go through a few samplings of the works. The entire grouping of the 105 artworks is in the report um, that was distributed to all of you already in um, your packet as well as um, available online. So um, I'm, let's go to the next slide. So um, for fun, I just wanted to sh again show you and juxtapose some of the artworks um, that have been proposed. So figurative works, um, have been proposed like this uh, painting by Chantelle Winook. Uh, it's titled Riverside to San Diego. Uh, text me on the 15, I think. Um, so this is a colorful work, um, which is juxtaposed against a work by John Oliver Lewis, which is a colorful abstracted form and a ceramic work called Tangy Tango. Next slide. And there are, there are sculptures that have been proposed as part of the 105 works, such as this work by Fashid Basaminigan, um, that's untitled, but quote unquote, mix it up. So it incorporates a concrete mixer, as well as their small intimate works, such as this magic, magical realism painting by this, by Mary Anella de la Hose called Absence of Presence. Next slide. There are photographic works in the, that are being proposed, such as this portrait titled Chicano Park, San Diego by John Mary Ellis, as well as, as, well as mixed media works like this piece by Alea Lanti titled From Chair Number Four. Next slide. Additionally, there are works that are inspired by places here in San Diego, such as this charcoal drawing by Maricel Rendon, or the video work by Christina Ree that's actually set in and uh, was and um, set in Balboa Park itself. Next slide. Additionally, their works that respond to San Diego, its environment and its weather, such as the work, uh, this neon work by Allison Weiss titled Plot Devices, Weather Saves the Day, to Steve Milner's print that explores uh, surf culture here in San Diego. The 105 artworks reflect the rich diversity of artistic talent and expression here in San Diego. This is a game changer for the collection and being able to acquire so many works at once, um, particularly when you start looking at the context and history of the collection. I believe this is a start 
for starting to focus on new acquisitions for focusing on San Diego artists. Um, and it's a really good start being able to support a number of artists in this acquisition process. So as far as the next slide goes, um, as you might remember, there's a total of $500,000 available for direct purchase of the artworks. Uh, the purchase of the works is contingent upon the city's verification of the artworks availability, the purchase price and condition, which is, is, will be occurring this fall. Uh, it's anticipated that delivery of the artworks will happen at the end of the year with installations of the works um, in winter and into spring uh, in public places. The artworks purchased through the process, as you probably can imagine at this point, will be included in the Civic Art Collection um, and they'll be installed in, in publicly accessible places for both residents uh, and visitors to enjoy as well as city employees. So the action before you today is to recommend to the city, the city of San Diego the purchase of 105 artworks through SD Practice for inclusion in the Civic Art Collection as submitted by the SD Practice Artwork Selection Panel. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Christine. Um, ben, did you want to uh, have guide some discussion? Well, I see that uh, Anne has uh, a speaking request. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's start with that. Anne? Thank you. I just wanted to ask a bit about the, um, the, the demographics and how that ties to the collection. I don't know if Jonathan could share more about that. If there's somebody better to address that topic, it might be helpful for folks to know. Uh, well, I'd be sure. happy to address it or go ahead, Jonathan. Why don't you start? Um, so first I wanna thank Christine for the, the presentation um, and thank you for the question. Um, there's two answers to that. The first answer is the historic nature of the collection um, doesn't allow us to fully understand demographics because <clears throat> the nature of the donations, the time that we received the donations, we weren't um, um, tracking or cataloging um, beyond just the name of the artist. Uh, so we don't, we can't um, in all confidence, talk about the demographics of the collection. Um, we can um, make some strong assumptions, but we can't really verify most of the pieces. Um, with that said, um, with this new addition um, to the collection, this 105 pieces, um, here's the bad news. Um, we did not ask for um, demographic information um, because that is city process right now. However, when we acquire the pieces, so when we actually sign the, the, um, um, the acquisition letter with the artist, we will be asking demographic information. This is part of the evolution um, through our DEI lens of um, not just becoming more transparent and aware, but also asking for shifts in city policies so that we can be more deliberate um, around questions of demographics. So all of that to say it's going to, we're going to be able to identify demographic information in the coming months. Um, it's never going to be complete, unfortunately. Christine, do you want to add to that? Um, I would. I would just add that you know tracing demographics um, is, is incredibly complicated in collections. Um, there's um, a lot of information that might be missing. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us to begin that tracking, specifically with SD practice. Um, so again, as Jonathan mentioned, we'll be asking artists to opt in to share information about themselves, about their practice. Um, so we can begin tracking that information in a much more thoughtful and intentional way. Um, and the one thing that I would add is um, this is part of the importance of um, the panel that is invited. Um, part of the role of it being a panelist is also getting the word out 
Uh, and this was the most impressive panel I have ever seen at work. They committed four full days um, to this work. Um, ben, you were, you were part of all of those, most of those conversations. Um, and they did their homework to the ex they did their homework in that they also were very proactive in making sure that this opportunity was made aware to artists throughout the region of all demographics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jonathan. Ben? Any uh, uh, any more questions from uh, the looks commissioners? Like, looks like Tyler has a question. Tyler? Yeah, I just, um, I want to congratulate uh, public art and uh, the staff for this really fantastic collection. But also I just, I'm really excited about the economic impact of this. $500,000 going into the local art team that averages about $4,700 per artist. Um, I'm sure it ranges based on the pieces, but that kind of uh, direct um, investment, I think, is really what's needed at this time. And I like that it's not commissioned work. It's not like we're saying, oh, let's put up you know, a new piece. These are already created, so we don't have to go through bureaucracy. We can just write them a check after buying the object. So I think that's really exciting. Um, the question I have is, Christine, has there been any discussion about next steps? Where are we displaying these? Where are we installing them? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, very good question. Um, so, you know, our first task obviously will be focusing on verifying availability, purchase, and, and, and getting those types of agreements and and bill of sales in place. So once the works are acquired, um, we, you know, we will be thoughtfully um, installing them in public spaces. That research is already underway with staff um, going um, and taking and going on go-sees to municipal buildings from airports to, um, uh, to libraries, to rec centers. So we're out actively looking at these spaces and trying to identify spaces that might be conducive for public display, as well as the specifics of the artworks that will be um, collected. So that work is underway. Um, so the intention is in the spring, um, though they will all be hopefully in a place uh, and be available to the public to enjoy. Just one quick yes. follow up. With so many new members of the city council coming on board, do you think there's any opportunity to offer up pieces to decorate their new offices? And that way our new city councilors We'll be able to see our public art uh, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, not just when they go to various places around the city. Um, well, you know, more importantly, is to get it in their council districts. So one of the things that we're really keen on is ensuring that these are publicly accessible works. So it's really important for us to put them in places in the council districts, such as their libraries within various council member districts, um, the rec centers, the parks, the municipal buildings around. So that's really what our focus and intention is. And we'll certainly be reaching out and letting them know that there are new works for them to explore and to communicate to their constituents. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looks like uh, Tracy has some comments. Tracy? Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. So, you know, I'm an avid social media watcher, and um, there was a comment or a question on one of the social media sites that I posted, you know, the, the application on. And um, a number of people, you know, were like, hey, did you get accepted? And, you know, there was a lot of responses, a lot of no's, you know, people were disappointed and that kind of stuff. But um, quite a few people um, were, even though they didn't, get accepted, they were still really happy with the choices that were made. Um, I made it a point to post the um, PDF of all of the, the 100 and, uh, 105 artwork selections so that people could see what was chosen um, because there was kind of this mystery, you know, if you submit a bunch of work and you don't know if, you're, if, if your work doesn't get accepted, you don't know what work was accepted and you start to kind of question, you know, what was accepted. But anyways, um, a good majority of the comments were very, very positive about the whole process 
and the fact that the city was doing this initiative and um, a number of people were extremely happy with the choices. Um, also, there was a couple of um, kind of odd things that people had suggested that I, I, I think is kind of valuable to share because um, people really wanna see this, but uh, a number of people were really interested in seeing all of the works that were proposed. And one person was like, it would be really great to see a book of all of the proposed pieces, you know? And I thought, well, I mean, that would be kind of interesting, you know, if, if you could see, because that would give you a really good uh, understanding of all of the artists that work in San Diego and who submitted artwork. So, I mean, I, I think it would be a great idea. I mean, obviously it doesn't have to be a book, but you know, if there could be some way that they could, it, we could showcase all of the art that was submitted, you know, I think that that would be a fun idea, um, a lot of work, but a fun idea. And then um, a couple of people were, you know, the, the, the ones that were not selected were kind of curious why, you know, and I know that a lot of jury, juried shows, you know, you don't get a response, you just submit the artwork. And if you don't hear from them, then you get nothing, you know, and you, you have no feedback. But, you know, this is one of those um, kind of learning opportunities for some people. And I, I think that if, if they're interested in getting feedback on maybe why their work wasn't selected, that that could be an option for people. Most people would be like, eh, whatever, you know, I didn't get selected, I'll try again next time or whatever. But for some people, it could have been a learning experience and maybe they want it to be a learning experience. So they, they are curious why their work wasn't selected. Was it not timely? Was it not significant? Was it not, you know, what they, you know, I don't know. So those were just um, some of the comments that I was, I was hearing on the thread of, of social media land. And uh, I thought they were valuable enough to share, but thank you. Thanks, Tracy, I saw that too. Um, it looks like Vernon has some comments. Yes, hi there, how's everybody doing? Good, good to see good, you. Good, thank you. Um, I wanna start by saying um, that it, it's a lovely collection uh, and clearly uh, um, uh, a, a really thoughtful, uh, uh, process was undertaken. Uh, I can see by uh, what I'm looking at and, and, and the names included. Um, this presentation started with uh, a very detailed description, more than I've ever imagined could be done, um, of the current civic art collection. Uh, and so you really got into the weeds there. And then this stuff um, is, is, uh, was less, um, uh, there are less details known uh, about this work and how it fits into the civic collection. So I would have liked to have known um, uh, the consideration kind of uh, um, uh, matrix that the decision makers used, including things like, I mean, I, I think we should be talking about or, 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 or somehow recognizing um, um, representation um, artists, but of the ideas uh, and, and forms that the art takes, um, the provenance uh, of, of, of the artists themselves. Uh, I see um, kind of legacy artists. Uh, I see kind of local practicing artists. I see emerging artists. Um, and what rings um, to me is that uh, it's, there's a, very good representation and I see certain names I'm like oh yeah that person this person and but you know I, I think it would be would serve the process well and certainly the commission well if we understood like how that worked like who are these people not who are they specifically but kind of generally like like you know so we decided to um, um, choose this person on the basis of the legacy that they have uh, left here or because of their current practice or their contributions or or whatever the dialogue is that they have with whoever they have it with. Okay, so kind of representation and provenance, I think that would be helpful. Um, I think Tracy had a great idea as far as a catalog. I think this would make a, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful uh, PDF. So um, catalog uh, to me uh, makes a, a great sense. It'd be a great celebration. I don't think it would be that much of, a, of an experience uh, or expense, I'm sorry. 
And uh, the last comment I have is I would have liked to see the prices. Um, if we're buying artwork, I don't think we need to be polite or shy about this. So it comes out to about 5K a pop, but I would like to know like, you know, what we're paid for these things. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Vernon. Um, ben, do you have anything else? Um, let's see, I, Tyler, did you want to add another comment? Oh, sorry, I see Anne has a comment. No, th this was uh, at 925. Nope, that was old. So I'm that was old, Thanks. okay. Anne? Um, really, I just wanted to echo what Vernon said in terms of the fiscal impact. And is there a way to illuminate the cost for each of the works and the direct tie to where that comes from? I know that it comes from a place that wouldn't impact the um, various funds that we're able to provide for fiscal year 21 and 22, but I think it would be important that everybody understand where it comes from so that they don't think that that in any way is pulling from an area that could hurt the individual nonprofits that are contractors. Thank you. Yes. I, I can thank, clarify thank that if that would be helpful. Yes. So um, the $500,000 was part of a large uh, a donation that included a monetary gift to the city as well as a donation of 27 paintings by the, of the late Thomas O. Rasmussen. The funds can only be used, they were restricted and can only be used for new acquisitions for the civic art collection. So they can't be used for any other purpose other than to acquiring artworks. Um, the artworks themselves range in price um, from a couple hundred dollars to 25,000. Um, and so again, we'll be verifying those prices with the artists in the coming weeks as we uh, move forward with uh, potential purchase. So hopefully that helps. Thanks. Uh, Vernon, it's got another comment. Yeah, but I just want to re react to that couple hundred to 25,000. Can you see like the disparity there? I mean, wow, we should know that. I'd like to know that. Um, yes, my quick question is, um, locations were locations considered uh, in advance of this purchase or or are we going to fit them uh, the best fit uh, janet how about if i jump in i i had had my hand raised so a couple things um the level of detail question um today is really the level of detail that was taken up at the public art committee uh, so they had an in-depth conversation um, around all of this, including the prices. Um, <clears throat> that was um, an extremely detailed conversation at the panel meeting as well. All of this, one of the levels of transparency that we can enjoy now is um, uh, the fact that these meetings are uh, in fact, on YouTube. So if anyone is interested in a, a really deep dive, um, we all have it recorded. Um, what I love about this is it's not written in minutes by staff. You're seeing it uh, in actuality. Um, so we have all of that information. We are happy to send you a link. We are happy to send you, you have an image of every piece in your packet. Um, but if you want any additional level of information, the one thing that we do not have right now is um, I want to see, I think it would be really good for all of us to know um, what council districts the artists live in. We have the zip codes. We haven't um, actually run the council district um, to the zip code yet. So we're going to do that, um, but appreciate um, all of the comments, and we're happy to get you that information. Okay, thanks. And uh, I just want to add that uh, when I first got the package with all the photos of the of the pieces of work, I, I spent like an hour going through it and uh, looking up the artist, and it was a wonderful, uh, inspiring, and creative experience. I feel I'm more knowledgeable about the 
uh, talent and capacity of the local artists. Uh, and uh, I should have been working, but I thought looking <laughs> through the package uh, was a lot more fun at the time. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I see, uh, I don't, uh, I can't believe the talent, the staff uh, in the public art uh, staff, it, it, putting all this together is just amazing. And I'm, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Ben, and thanks Public Art Committee. Um, Christine and the public art team, um, I love this project. I think um, this is exactly the kind of thing that I think the community wants to see us doing is um, working with individual artists instead of just um, institutions, you know? And so I think this is a great thing. Um, so would somebody like to make a motion uh, to recommend um, this acquisition? Type your name and I'll call on you or type speak and I'll call on you. Somebody like to make a motion? Keith? I would like to recommend uh, to the city the purchase of 105 artworks through the San Diego Practice for inclusion in the city art collection as submitted by the San Diego Practice Artwork Selection Panel. Thank you, well said. And Jason? I second. Thank you. Tyler? Tyler, you asked to speak, were you just seconding? Yeah, I was just seconding, sorry about that. All right, great. Is there any further discussion on this action item? All right, seeing none, uh, then I will go ahead and um, call for your vote. Um, remember to unmute you yourself and say yay, nay, or abstain. Um, so I'm gonna start with Commissioner Frank. Yay. Commissioner Blevins. Commissioner Bossler? Yay. Uh, Commissioner DeCenzo? Yay. Commissioner Hughes? Yay. Commissioner Jackson? Yay. Commissioner Meza? Yay. Commissioner Obsted? Yay. Commissioner Whooper? Yay. And my vote is a yay. Very good, motion carries. Thank you everybody. Um, and thanks again for all your work on that. Um, some really interesting pieces and I love uh, the ideas that have come out of our conversation here today. Okay, so next up we have advocacy and outreach. Is there any public comment to be read? No, there's no public comment on this item. Thank you, Christine. Um, Commissioner Hughes, would you like to share your committee report? Uh, we did not have a committee meeting this month, but we do have one coming up on November the 6th. Very excited about that as we plan for 2021. And uh, by then we'll have uh, an idea of who the incoming city councilors are going to be and um, the best way to approach them, especially as we move forward with a plan for implementing Penny for the Arts. So it's going to be uh, really a, a great meeting and excited to talk about planning for the rest of 2020 and 2021 and beyond. Oh, right. uh, one thing I did, uh, I participated, uh, it's already been mentioned, I participated in the rest of the uh, candidate forum. It's really exciting to hear these city council candidates talk about the Penny for the Arts specifically and about arts and culture on a more generalized term. You know, varying levels of engagement and uh, pre-existing knowledge that you can clearly see that they had done their homework. They wanted to learn more about what we do as a commission and what our arts ecosystem does for our constituency. So it's, it's really exciting to hear. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, moving on to Commissioner Engagement Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, I know uh, Commissioner Nuana is out of town. Uh, Commissioner Bossler, would you as vice chair have a report of any business on that committee? To my knowledge, nothing has been discussed. So I'm sorry, I do not have a report. Thank you. 
Alrighty, uh, next up we have a presentation, um, and this is in regard to the relocation of uh, some statues in Presidio Park, the Padre and the Indian sculptures. And I'm happy to welcome Bill Lawrence here today. He's the CEO of the San Diego History Center, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the relocation of those sculptures. Um, Bill, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak with you all today and to meet with you. Um, I do have a presentation, uh, and thank you for get, uh, to the staff for getting that up. Um, before I start, I want to say um, I really appreciate the presentation that Christine gave on the uh, civic art collection and the background on it and the history of it. In many ways, it mirrors the fine art collection of the San Diego History Center. We have over 1,700 pieces of fine art. Um, our, our strength is in heritage works, um, but um, and the two statues and the two sculptures that um, I'm going to be discussing this morning are part of that uh, are part of that collection. Um, next slide, please. So the San Diego Historical Society, and we're known today as the San Diego History Center, is seeking a right of entry permit from the City of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department. And that right of entry permit is necessary to facil facilitate the relocation of the historic Arthur Putnam sculptures, Indian and Padre, from Presidio Park to the San Diego History Center Museum in Balboa Park. This is a process that we've actually internally began probably about two and a half to three years ago now. We have made significant investment in the new and new exhibits at the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park which is the historic home for the San Diego History Center. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of background on the sculptures. They are the property of the San Diego History Center and were acquired from the E.W. Scripps Estate in 1975. And they are accessioned as part of our fine art collection. This co the sculptures, and you're looking at um, the Indian on the right, this is from the 1975 uh, Journal of San Diego history, which we continue to publish today. But the sculptures were commissioned by E.W. Scripps as part of the series of five sculptures to commemorate San Diego, California, and U.S. history. Of the five conceived pieces, only three were completed, the Indian and Padre, which were now at Presidio Park, and the Plowman, which was donated to Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where it is currently on display. Next slide, please. The sculptures are the work of Arthur Putnam, a recognized um, master sculptor, and were completed between 1905 and 1911. They were designed at Miramar, not the Naval Air Station, but Miramar was Scripps's home and is the namesake for Miramar Ranch and Scripps Ranch. Uh, the sculptures were cast in San Francisco and then displayed at Miramar, Scripps's home. The sculptures were loaned by the Scripps Foundation to the San Diego Historical Society in 19, 1933 and were placed on newly constructed concrete bases in Presidio Park. And one item of interest is that this was prior to Presidio Park being conveyed to the city of San Diego in 1937 by George Marston, who was the founder of the San Diego Historical Society. The photo that you see on the right is uh, the Padre at Scripps uh, uh, Scripps' home, Miramar, uh, approximately about 1922, if I remember the date correctly. And um, so that is uh, from the historic San Diego History Center collection. Next slide, please. So we began this process about talking about relocating the sculptures, um, as I mentioned several years ago. And the reason for this is that the are several, but the first is that the sculptures are showing signs of age due to weathering and proximity to the pollutants of the Interstate 8 and Interstate 5, which were not historically not there when Presidio Park was created. The sculptures have been vandalized over the years, most recently within the past now five to six months of the Padre, and you see on the right the, um, the tagging that was done. And within the last two years, the Indian has been um, vandalized as well. Uh, there are also issues with the sculptures um, and the context in which they're exhibited in the fact that the Padre, while not a memorial to Sarah, is often mistaken as one, 
The Indian represents a Plains Indian and does not represent any of the indigenous um, uh, members of the community. And the sculptures, um, frankly, present a romanticized portrayal of, of the events that occurred at the Presidio site. Next slide, please. So we at the San Diego History Center believe relocation of these sculptures offer some opportunities. The first is that relocation to our museum within Balboa Park provides for greater preservation from both the elements and from potential vandalism. It allows us to begin providing better historical context. It places the artworks in the context of works of similar time and subject, allowing for critical review and contemplation regarding the portrayal of complex historical narratives. The display um, of the works can be in conjunction with other works, for example, by Bel Baranchano, our WPA murals uh, for Portola's expedition and building Mission Dam, which are located uh, within the uh, museum presently. And it allows us to provide context of, about the role of sculptures and statues as artifacts that shed light on early 20th century Anglo-American ideas about progress, civilization, and race. Next slide, please. The process, the San Diego History Center has contracted with Artwork San Diego to handle sculptural removals. Um, Artwork San Diego is an authorized vendor with the City of San Diego for restoration of works in the Civic Art Collection and are highly recognized for their work um, in the community. As each sculpture is mounted slightly differently and in different locations within Presidio Park and the historic grounds, each sculpture's removal is slightly different. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, Google Earth view of uh, where the sculptures are located. You'll notice that the Padre sculpture is in that um, in kind of uh, grotto area uh, that is covered by um, with uh, trees. It's just slightly to the, I believe, Christine, correct me, slightly to the um, east of the historic Sarah Cross. And then the Indian sculpture is to the uh, northwest um, in what was the uh, historic barracks area of Presidio Park. Next slide, please. So this is looking into, from the street Presidio Drive, looking into where the sculpture is located. You'll notice the historic Sarah Cross is to the right. Next slide, please. And again, heading to the northwest uh, to where the Indian sculpture is located. If you'll advance to the next slide. That off to the right is the view of the Indian sculpture. And next slide, please. So for both the Padre and the Indian, Artwork San Diego will remove the sculptures, taking care to protect the artworks. The concrete bases will be brought to ground level to avoid a trip hazard. And this is at the request of Park and Rec Department. And then Park and Rec and the city will cover the grass uh, cover the remainder of the bases with grass and or mulch that's appropriate to the area that the uh, statues have been removed from. Um, it is not the intention of the History Center to do any deep digging um, to disturb potential uh, historic artifacts that, that may result, that may still reside within the Presidio grounds. As a reminder, the historic, um, the archeological digs have been um, approximately four over the last 40 to 50 years. And so the grounds have already been um, disturbed, it is, but it is not our intention to do so. Next slide, please. So we have consulted with uh, historians that are very familiar with Presidio Park and the San Diego Historical Society, um, including Ethan Benegas of Kumeyaay College, who is an advisor, part of our historic, history, historian advisory board. Dr. Iris Engstrin, Professor Emeritus at USD, both David Miller of USD and Andy Strathman of CSU San Marcos, who are both co-editors of the Journal of San Diego History. Next slide, please. We have all, and also we have reached out to other members, particularly of the Kumeyaay uh, Nation, nations, um, for their input. And to date, all, um, as well as having given this uh, presentation to at least three other community groups and have received um, 
uh, support for this project. And I'd like to leave you with this quote from Lonnie Bunch, who is uh, Secretary of the Smithsonian and who is the founding director of the African American Museum of History and Culture. And this is from a New York Times article shortly, uh, well, in July, after uh, the pandemic uh, closed all institutions and we began discussions uh, around um, Confederate statues and the idea of um, what sculptures and artwork says about uh, society. And the notion of simply pulling down statues means that you're really not bringing historical insight. What you really want to do is use the statues as teachable moments. Some of these need to go, and he's primarily referring to Confederate statues, but, other, but others need to be taken into a park, into a museum, into a warehouse, and interpreted for people, because they're part of our history. And at the San Diego History Center, we believe that this is the appropriate time um, to relocate these sculptures. Uh, historically, they have been there for quite some time. However, um, we really believe that from both a preservation standpoint for the future as well as an interpretation standpoint that we need to be proactive and now is the time to do this. And that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bill. Very good. Uh, interesting. I didn't, uh, I don't think I ever noticed those statues when I was at, up in Presidio Park. So it's nice to have some background on them. Uh, does anybody else have a comment to make? Please type speak in your chat box and I'll call on you. All right. Um, seeing there are no further questions, uh, Bill, I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you very much for joining us today and um, showing us those interesting images and explaining what you're doing with those statues. I look forward to seeing them in the History Center. I do love those two uh, paintings that you mentioned. Um, the Portola and the um, Building the Mission Dam. I do love those two paintings. So I'll look forward to seeing the statues there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. And um, thank you so much for the work that you all do for um, our community. Thanks. Um, okay, next up um, in, uh, we are gonna have our presentation of our creative economy study, which um, we commissioned in uh, 2000, June of 2019. Uh, I'm gonna ask Jonathan to go ahead and present that to us. Thank you, Janet. Um, Bill, can you go to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the flip book, please? Oh, Maybe Carla you? is doing that. It wasn't the... Sorry, Jonathan, it's not me. Well, while we're waiting for um, that PowerPoint to be brought up, just to remind everyone, uh, we commissioned this study, <clears throat> excuse me, jointly with the De uh, Department of Economic Development about 18 months ago now to um, take a baseline measure of the creative economy in San Diego. I'm gonna move quickly through this uh, in respect of everyone's time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just to frame this, um, <clears throat> the creative economy is the combination of for-profit and non-profit uh, creative, uh, creative businesses, as it were. Um, the measure uh, the measure of investment in and leveraging of creative economy um, sectors across the country and actually globally has been um, a key tool um, for uh, cities and regions oh, for probably two decades now. Um, we are definitively behind the curve in San Diego in understanding our creative economy, um, which brought us to our interest in this first baseline measure 
couple quick notes. Um, the state of California is measured by Otis College uh, every few years. Uh, that began with an LA study also a couple decades ago. Um, now the state, um, it's a statewide measure. Um, but we wanted to, we wanted to um, assess this, the, um, uh, the industries here utilizing the same measuring kit, as it were, that the EDC uses, the Economic Development Corporation, um, for other business sectors in San Diego. So we really wanted an apples to apples approach. Um, which is exactly why we wanted um, the EDC to conduct the assessment. Um, UCSD was uh, subcontracted to do some actual um, um, direct surveys of creative businesses for both for-profit and nonprofit. Those surveys went to the C-suite as well as <clears throat> to the HR offices. Um, that level of detail I'm not going to get into today. Um, I'm happy to bring this study back to uh, policy and funding at a later point to dig in more deeply, but we wanted to bring um, just a high level to you today. Um, we will be rolling this out to local media over the next week. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Next slide, please. So just to remind everyone, uh, the creative economy is essentially the measure of creative businesses and creative occupations. So at a creative business, you're looking at the entire activity. So at an ad agency or an architecture firm, but very importantly, at a non-creative uh, firm, there are creatives embedded. So we're looking at both there. And that is really where this um, is an ex exponential multiplier. Next slide, please. So important graph, um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> For-profit uh, is about 60% of the field. Nonprofit is about 34%. And then a few other, which is going to include universities, local governments, et cetera. Because this is an ED study, study, it did look at the county. Obviously the highest concentration and the vast majority of the activity was in the city of San Diego proper with um, nodes of concentration primarily in North County. Next slide, please. So here you go, here's the takeaway. Uh, when we annually look at just our contractors, there's about 10,000 employees uh, and about a billion dollars of economic activity that's pre-COVID. When you look at the creative industries, you're talking about well over 100,000 <clears throat> jobs, over 7,000 creative firms, and total economic impact is over 11 billion. Now, I need to um, place a caveat here. These, this data is pre-COVID. So the EDC ran a very simple analysis in October that does show about a 14% decrease post COVID. Um, so we've asked the EDC to um, keep us apprised as they are running their um, monthly sector measures um, so that we can start tracking this. Uh, so this is, uh, this is pre COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Firms by industry, communication arts by far the largest, architecture and interior design, 
publishing and printing, visual and performing arts, entertainment, museums, um, down to industrial design services. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to find out with this baseline is what is our USP? What is unique to San Diego? Uh, do we have profound weaknesses in any area? Is there a, um, um, a sector that is particularly strong or unique to San Diego? Um, what we found is more of an across the board um, similarity to other comparable size cities. So saying that in a different way, Nashville obviously spikes in music. Austin spikes in music. San Francisco spikes in furniture design. Houston spikes in photography. Um, we don't have a particular um, space where we are particularly strong. We don't have a, a space where we're particularly weak either. What this shows us is there is a lot of opportunity to grow. Um, um, the study also looked at uh, perspective uh, growth in these different categories. Um, as you can imagine, publishing and printing is not on a growth trajectory. Um, however, um, music is, museums is, entertainment, visual and performing arts um, are all on a growth trajectory. Again, more or less in scale with um, other cities, um, other comparable cities, Portland, Denver, uh, Boston, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. Interestingly, we wanted to see the customer base, be it vendors, um, or audiences. Uh, what we found is creative economy is a regional industry, uh, which is good. That means that we are hiring locals. Um, it means that when we expand creative industries, we're creating more jobs for the region, for San Diegans, and by extension, Baja Southern California. So that's the good news. This also means that we have a lot of opportunity to grow creative businesses uh, nationally and internationally. Um, this is where we don't fare as well as the Austins and the Denvers and the Bostons, uh, okay. and certainly um, uh, the three uh, largest cities. Uh, so a lot of opportunity. Uh, the other thing that I would say is um, we really wanted to see how deep we go into um, Baja and Tijuana, not as deep as you would think. Um, so that is actually a growth area because we know anecdotally a lot of creative businesses are in Tijuana and they're there because of their, uh, the, uh, uh, the convenience to Southern California, which means we're not doing as good of a job as building those... <laughs> Good. Um, I see Tyler has a question. Just Jonathan, can you define for us uh, what entertainment is versus performing in visual arts or any of the others? Uh, what, what is classified in the study as entertainment? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so entertainment would be, um, firstly, entertainment is going to be for-profit, not non-profit. Uh, and secondly, there are areas where, uh, so um, comedy would be entertainment, not performing arts. Next slide, please. Uh, another a really important key takeaway with this, uh, um, tremendous number of creative workers, self-employed, or employed by extremely small firms. 
Uh, so when we're focusing, when we're talking about the individual creative or the individual artist, be it that individual that who I envision when I'm, when we're talking about this is that lighting designer um, that may be married to our chair um, who um, works at a nonprofit theater, but also works at the convention center and also works in video and film production um, at a large theater company. Um, that individual is very likely employed by a small company or is freelance. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways. Next slide. Um, coming out of the uh, surveys, the direct surveys, we found a couple of things. Space needs um, across the board, be it for-profit and non-profit, are an issue. Um, lack of brand um, of San Diego as a uh, creative city um, is problematic when they are cultivating business um, outside of San Diego. Um, however, overall, there's a very positive um, sense of um, getting the work done in San Diego, i.e. working with vendors, working with local government, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, the highest challenge is in fact the high cost of living or the high cost of doing business uh, and ensuring that San Diego is attractive as an affordable place. Um, and again, this is pre-COVID, so I think those numbers would just be um, more profound. Next slide, please. So I wanna thank, uh, no, go back, please. Uh, I, I wanna thank the steering committee. Um, the EDC is part of their contract, um, brought together a steering committee of creative professionals um, to help guide this first round of research. Um, I'd like to underscore that the intent of this study was simply to create a baseline. So there are no recommendations or takeaways. Um, this is our first snapshot of what creative, the creative economy looks like here in San Diego. Final thing I'd like to say is um, more than 100,000 people employed and $11 billion of economic activity uh, is nothing to sneeze at. So there's great power in these numbers. And Janet, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and that was very enlightening. I um, Especially I like uh, the graphs. I find it easy to understand things that way. And um, it's quite impressive uh, what a vibrant part of our economy the um, arts are. So um, anybody have any questions for Jonathan in regard to the uh, sur survey that he just presented? Tyler, is that a new speak from you? It is not, Janet. Thank you very much, though. All right. Uh, I did want to say uh, this is it's illuminating, and I do love that the identification that San Diego does not have popularly a, a thing, which is surprising because we're one of America's best art, uh, theater cities, and that we're not identified as an innovator and incubator of great theater. Um, you know, I, I pound for pound, I put us up with, there with anybody else. And also uh, of uh, contemporary visual art. You know, we're a, we're a really fascinating um, incubator of, of great art as we have seen. So it's interesting that we're just sort of jack of all trades without a, a, a key identifier. <clears throat> Thank you, Tyler. Um, Tracy, you had a comment? I actually had a question about the brand message, Jonathan. You said something about we're not good at 
doing showing our brand what what do you what do you mean by that i i i didn't follow that one particular aspect um what the what the what the study really has revealed and anecdotally um um it's known um it was known already because we have not intentionally focused on creative industries in the same way that we have intentionally focused on technology or biotech, for example. Um, there's a number of um, brand tools that a variety of stakeholders use, um, as you know, to get the message out that this is a city that does business in this sector. Um, so I'll give you a, a very specific example. Um, in the city of Washington, DC, previously not known for creative businesses at all, um, when the District of Columbia decided to strategically invest in creative industries, they created a singular office and that office's job is to cultivate, retain, attract and retain creative businesses. Um, Atlanta has done the same thing. Denver has done the same thing. Um, that also feeds into tourism branding, business development branding, um, so it becomes integrated into all of the um, communications tools um, across the various um, organizations that are um, empowered to um, build a brand um, around the city. City of Philadelphia um, actually has a freestanding brand agency and their job is only creative economy branding. Uh, so it's been a very intentional part of business development for a long time in a number of cities. And we're, we're not doing that in San Diego. Obviously, we're not doing that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'd like to add yet to your comment. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Jonathan, thank you for your, uh, do you have any further report? Uh, I do have an ED report, um, if you'd like me to quickly go into that. Yes, please. Um, but I don't want to be respectful of, we have 15 minutes left, and I really want to turn it over to uh, Leticia and Christine. Um, so I am going to hold my report about the challenge fund until next month. I will just very quickly say... Um, the challenge fund, which was established as part of the mayor's challenge back in March, uh, that the stimulus came out of, um, uh, the SD practice and park social, um, there has been about $354,000, $355,000 raised, um, through rounds one and two. Um, and I'm very, very, very um, pleased to report that um, we have been able to uh, direct grants to uh, small um, nonprofit arts and cultural organizations countywide, as well as a number of individual artists, um, um, all of whom are BIPOC artists. Uh, so we're delighted about that. We're moving into phase three with a generous grant from the Parker Foundation, and I'll bring more information in November to the Policy and Funding Committee. Um, but I would like to move it, or excuse me, turn it over to Christ Christine for a fast update on a new initiative um, in one of the neighborhoods. And then I'd like Leticia to update you all on um, the work about the uh, around the funding program, and then Jan and I have a special uh, announcement after that. So, uh, Christine, if you could take it away. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So, um, so 
as you all know, Here Comes the Neighborhood is an initiative that our office um, is working on. And so um, it's obviously bringing visually engaging and conceptual uh, rich works to San Diego neighborhoods. As part of the initiative, it was identified that we would be working on um, over time, four different neighborhoods for um, and really looking at neighborhoods that may not um, have as much artwork in it um, for various reasons over time. So I'm really, and I guess I would just add if you go to the next, don't go to the next slide quite yet, but basically just to remind you the first init- um, iteration is in San Ysidro. So we've been working on that. For uh, the last few years, the artists have been exploring San Ysidro and the neighborhood. Um, The artists are currently um, in fabrication for those projects. So we anticipate installation and completion of that first iteration by the first half of 2021. So because we're nearing the end of our first bring up to start the second iteration. So we're very pleased to report and uh, announce that the, the new neighborhood, if you'll go to the next slide, um, is in Canto neighborhoods. So um, this will be the, the second iteration of the initiative. Um, artists will be selected, three artists specifically will be selected to, um, to explore that, those neighborhoods and de- developing conceptually rich permanent artworks uh, in the context of those spaces. So if you go to the next slide, So the neighborhood was identified um, in keeping with the overall project plan that was approved for the initiative a number of years ago. Um, And our guiding principles for the initiative, we've identified in Canto uh, for a number of reasons. Um, In Canto had a community plan update just a few years ago. And within that um, community plan, public art was mentioned over 30 times um, and art was mentioned over 50 times in that community plan update. So clearly there is an interest on the part of this neighborhood for public art. Um, So we really want to dovetail that. We think it dovetails nicely with the initiative for Here Comes the Neighborhood. Uh, In addition, also, um, this is really an opportunity to really be a catalyst for the future of that neighborhood. There'll be, again, three artists that will be commissioned. Um, Public will be engaged in various activities as part of that during the project. Um, we'll be bringing back more information and, and your um, recommendations for panelists um, at a later date. We're, we don't anticipate getting started until uh, doing a call in winter of 21, 2021, and completion will probably be in 2023, but we wanted to just bring it up and let you know that this is our next neighborhood. So, um, you know, we're really excited. And I would just add this on top of the purchase of SD practice artworks on top of the park social initiative that we're working on is really, really focusing in an unprecedented way on artists um, within California and particularly San Diego. So we're really excited to be able to move forward with this project. So now I will hand it over to Leticia to give you an update on funding program. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Hello again, commissioners. I'll just give you a really quick overview on where we're at with the funding program. Uh, As you know, we did release the guidelines and open up the RFQ for um, the Organizational Support Program and Creative Community San Diego, OSP and CCSD on October 12th, as well as uh, opened up the application for the CARES grant initiative also on October 12th. Both, um, all three of these are, have a due date of November 13th. Um, We've been really busy uh, already in the past two weeks um, doing uh, intro to city arts funding workshops. Um, These have been hosted by council districts. So in the past two weeks, we've already done one with council district eight, six, four, two, and one. And uh, we have one coming up tomorrow with um, council district nine. Uh, And these are being hosted by council members. So basically they are Zoom um, webinar meetings uh, and they're opened up and in, uh, with a welcome with the council members uh, who address the attendees. Some of we've had a really good attendance on these um, upwards of like 40, I think we had um, in one of them. Um, in particular, Council District 8, um, for Council Member Moreno's office, they actually streamed there live on Facebook while we were doing it. So we had an opportunity to both take questions from the Zoom attendance as well as from those who were watching it live on Facebook. So we got to address a lot of questions. A lot of these are new organizations. Um, So these have been um, really helpful 
um, for us to introduce our programs to the community, but also for the council members to have an opportunity to encourage applicants in their district to apply. Um, we've also um, already had one RFQ workshop, and this is a, a deep dive into all the elements of the RFQ, guiding um, potential applicants and returning applicants into each section. Uh, we had one this Tuesday. Um, we had 48 uh, attendees registered and 13 of those were brand new uh, organizations. Uh, we have another one scheduled for the 29th uh, and we already have 56 um, um, folks registered for that and 13 are also new uh, applicants. Um, later today at 12.30 p.m. we're going to be having a workshop on our CARES grant initiative. Um, so this is the, um, the one-time uh, CARES Act funding that is open to all of San Diego County. Uh, so that's a little bit different. So we've been uh, trying to do extended outreach uh, outside of the city of San Diego, allowing us to engage uh, organizations who could also be potential CCSD applicants. So, so this is great. This is also focused on arts and culture nonprofits that are serving BIPOC communities. So also a great opportunity for us to reach out to these specific audiences. Um, and finally, we will be having a special fiscal sponsorship workshop on October 30th. And this is because we want to make sure that, um, that applicants who are not 501c3s are aware of, of um, how they can take advantage of the CCSD opportunity to apply for city funding through a fiscal sponsor. So this is a great opportunity, not only for non arts and culture organizations doing uh, art events and art projects, but also for artists and art collaboratives uh, engaging in art productions or art uh, projects also to be able to potentially take advantage of these CCSD funds. Thank you, Leticia. So um, <clears throat> I, I wanna just frame um, these two refor reports for a minute. Um, I asked Leticia to uh, make this report because um, staff is taking, well, let me step back for a minute. Um, it is profoundly important um, to us that we recognize every day that that COVID-19 study shows 40% less employed in the nonprofit arts um, Council Member Bosler um, was very vocal at the beginning of COVID that uh, this was potentially catastrophic and um, staff does not think one day about anything else but the fact that we are in this situation. Um, the team was working at 11.30 last night to pull information together. Um, the team is working every weekend. Um, we are in a situation, as you know, where staff has been reduced and we've doubled our commitment to getting resources out to the community. Um, so I wanna thank the team. Uh, um, for the level of commitment. The work is, there is more work and they're doing it in a smarter way. Um, the level of outreach that's happening in the month of October, I can't say is unprecedented. I certainly haven't been here over the last four decades, but I can say it is extraordinary. Um, we're very committed to making sure that individual artists and organizations that have not had access before understand how to access the funding so they have every, uh, every opportunity. We have a long way to go, but that is the commitment every day. So I wanna thank the staff for that. Um, however, I have some unfortunate news. Um, <laughs> look at Tracy. <laughs> um, Leticia Gomez Franco is leaving us <laughs> uh, for career advancement. Um, so I think everybody can agree when a team member moves on to something that only enhances their career, you've done your job, right? 
So we're very happy for Leticia, but I want you all to know now before it becomes uh, particularly public next week uh, that Leticia will be leaving us in about a month. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, Leticia, I don't know if you wanna say anything now, if not, you've got next month um, with this group as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll save my, my comments for next month, but I, I do just wanna say a quick uh, thank you to uh, both the staff and, and the commissioners for a most rewarding experience uh, over the past couple of years. This has been great, thank you. Janet, I'm turning it back to you. Well, thanks for that. I mean, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your report, Leticia. Congratulations. Very happy for you. Um, bumped out for us, but I imagine we'll be seeing and hearing from you anyway. So um, thank you for all the work you've done here. And um, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure you'll be a huge success no matter where you go. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, anybody have any new business for future agendas that you would like to bring up? Okay, I do not see any uh, comment, anybody wishing to speak. So um, uh, I'm gonna move on um, in, when we usually do our speed round of creative I things. I have something I wanted to say, I said speak, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it, Anne. I'm, it's hard to watch all of these things at once. Go ahead, Anne. Sure. Well, first and foremost, I just wanna say congratulations to Leticia and also a big thank you to her and to the rest of the team. You, you all have been doing um, an incredible job under very difficult circumstances and um, great appreciation to each and every one of you and Leticia Godspeed. Hope that your next opportunity is um, profoundly wonderful and don't, don't hesitate to continue to be in touch, please. You've been terrific. Um, part two of what I wanted to say is, um, something for an agenda for a future would be a request that if staff could please once again, and we do this on kind of an iterative basis, look at who's attending meetings and who's not. I think that we're quickly getting to the moment where we really need everybody on deck. And so if we um, as a commission and as a staff could please present at the next meeting a review of of kind of what the rules and regulations are around attendance. And for those folks that life happens and we all understand that, but I think we need to seriously consider making sure that we have people on board that can push this work forward. So thank you to everybody's here and everybody that's attending and to staff and Leticia specifically today in light of the news. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Janet. Thank you, Commissioner Bosler. Okay, anybody else? Okay, the one thing I do uh, that I would like to share uh, that happened this week is um, on Facebook, I'm in a group, it's called Buy Nothing. Maybe you know about it, maybe you don't. But anyway, it's a thing where people give away and share things. And um, the other day, somebody was offering four uh, free passes to the Museum of Art. And I was so gratified to see the response of people who were so excited to be able to, there were a lot of people who responded and said, oh yeah, I'd love to go. I, you know, we love that place. We used to go when it was free on Tuesday. Um, I, it just really brought home to me, um, number one, that there is public will out there. There are people out there who are excited about the idea of going to an art museum. And just because, um, maybe we don't see them coming to our meetings or commenting on our stuff. They're out there. And that, that made me really, I was gratified by that. And also, um, at the same time, I thought, wow, what a bummer it is that any of these museums have to charge anything at all. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people could just walk in there? And if that was what was keeping some of these people from going, I mean, I, I kind of felt like answering every person who didn't get the tickets and saying, I'll pay your way. I'll buy you a ticket. You know, I'm excited because you want to go to the art museum. So um, that was my uh, experience this week. I, I really found a moment of joy there 
on Facebook of all places. And um, it made me feel like maybe we are building public will. Maybe all of this outreach is really helping us um, connect people to the arts in, in ways that they hadn't thought of before. So yay for us, yay for all the people that we work with and yay for this wonder, wonderful staff um, and including Leticia, I, although um, we really will miss you. Um, I'm sure Jonathan is going to find us somebody and that's just as wonderful and um, important to our work here. And Anne, Thank you, uh, has to take off. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn this meeting unless anybody else has something else. All righty, thank you very much everybody for attending and for participating. Well, we'll see you all soon, be well. Bye, have a great weekend. Oops, bye everyone. Leticia. <laughs> mad at you. <laughs>